You can open your Bibles this evening to the book of Romans. That will be the first book we're going to be turning to as we uh, move through the 11th chapter of the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. The 11th chapter. We're going to start in Romans, the third chapter, if you want to open your Bibles there. This 11th chapter addresses the subject of justification. Last chapter, as you will recall, dealt with the effectual call where God, through the working of the Holy Spirit with His Word, births a person into His kingdom, calling them in and with that inner call and gives them that new nature and with that new nature faith. And so this evening, as we move into justification, we're looking at the, 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 a logical order here, and we're looking at what is transpiring then in that logical order sense. So, of justification. Paragraph number one. Of those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and soul righteousness. They receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. We'll read through each paragraph as is our custom and then we'll start back again. Paragraph number two, and as you'll recall and you've noted already, and usually in the first paragraph, that's an overview of all that's going to follow in that particular section. So now we're moving into the second paragraph. Faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness, is the alone instrument of justification. Yet it is not alone in the person justified but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. Paragraph number three. Christ, by his obedience and death, did fully discharge the debt of all those that are justified and did by the sacrifice of himself in the blood of his cross, undergoing in their stead the penalty due unto them, make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to God's justice in their behalf. Yet inasmuch as he was given by the Father for them, and his obedience and satisfaction accepted in their stead, and both freely, not for anything in them, their justification is only of free grace, that both the exact justice and rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. Paragraph number four. God did from all eternity decree to justify all the elect, and Christ did in the fullness of time, die for their sins and rise again for their justification. Nevertheless, they are not justified personally until the Holy Spirit doth in time do actually apply Christ unto them. Paragraph number five. God doth continue to forgive the sins of those that are justified, 
and although they can never fall from the state of justification, yet they may, by their sins, fall under God's fatherly displeasure. And in that condition they have not usually the light of his countenance restored unto them until they humble themselves, confess their sins, beg pardon, and renew their faith and repentance. It's paragraph number six. The justification of believers under the Old Testament was in all these respects one and the same with the justification of believers under the New Testament. We'll begin back with paragraph one of justification. Those whom God, whoops, that ain't going to work, is it? Sorry about that. Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth. Romans chapter 3, and move there to verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. With Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. You know, whenever we're talking about justification, again, it's something that applies only to the elect of God, and in particular, the believing elect of God. And as we will eventually look at in this document, there are those who are elect that have not yet been um, regenerated and consequently have not uh, uh, believed and consequent to that haven't been justified, but they will in due time as God's Holy Spirit applies Christ to them in the experiential sense. But it is a sure and certain thing does that make sense? It will happen. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 is explicitly clear. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, that's that effectual call, he also justified. And as you know, the rest of the verse goes on to say, those same individuals are the ones who will be glorified. No one else nothing else, God's will for his people. Notice it goes on and it says, not by infusing righteousness unto them, but by pardoning their sins. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the man to whom God credits righteousness. And notice this, apart from what? Apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been forgiven, or covered, excuse me. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And that not by their works, right? He's not taking their sins to account because they worked righteousness. Not because righteousness was infused to them as they worked. That's basically the Roman Catholic position. The Roman Catholic position is not imputation of righteousness, but infusion of righteousness. And that takes place as you keep certain aspects of um, God's Word, the sacraments, for example, as they would say, and there are multiple ones. And as you do those, a certain level of righteousness is infused 
to you. And we're not dealing with infusion, as this document clearly brings out, but we are dealing with the imputation of righteousness, not by works. Roman Catholicism, as you do, God infuses. So, you're meriting in one sense, you're working to receive that righteousness. They wouldn't necessarily say that they are working for salvation because they would say, no, it's all by grace. But whenever they get down to the nitty-gritty of explaining how it is on the basis of infusion and they link that with what you do, in essence, they're saying that you are are the one who is earning your righteousness. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, that is Christ, through His blood, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Again, a powerful verse. Christ being the basis, it is in Him and through His blood, His death on the cross, that uh, we have redemption. And that redemption encompasses eventually our justification. And it is by God's grace, according as verse 7 says, to the riches of His grace. And by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous. So really, justification, if you could give it a very short definition, is the act by which unjust sinners are made right in the sight of a just and holy God. You remember Jesus said, we have to be perfect, right? As our Father in heaven is perfect, right? Did he say that? Or is that something we made up? He said it, didn't he? Go over with me to Matthew chapter 5 for a moment. Matthew chapter 5, and in 5, go down to verse 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Did he say you're to do your best, as your heavenly Father is the best? No. He demands perfection. Christ demands perfection, doesn't he? And that perfection will not be found in any one of us who are sinners, will it? But it is in Christ. His righteousness is perfect righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us, or to us, wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's our boast. It's in Him, totally, isn't it? And that's not a hypocritical boast for the Christian, for the true Christian, for someone who is maintaining that they are justified by having the righteousness infused to them based on their works, their boast is a false boast. Because they may attribute that to Christ, but really they're working. That's a false boast. But the Christian, having the righteousness of Christ imputed, not infused, but imputed to his or her account, who boasts in Christ, that person is lining up with Scripture whenever they truly boast in Christ, because they truly are. <clears throat> you know, the Bible sets the liar 
against God. He's truth. And the liar is repeating falsehood and conveying falsehood. And to boast in Christ, whenever on one hand you're maintaining a self-righteousness, is a falsehood, an assault on God and His Word, His truth. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, excuse me, that's not the correct one, that's 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression the, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And the context of this verse and the reason they're quoting it, again, is to demonstrate that the righteousness belongs to Christ. It's His obedience, not our obedience, that is in view at this particular point in time. Um, back up into our document in the fourth paragraph, or excuse me, first paragraph, in the middle of it, not for anything wrought in them, that is righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them. It's Christ's righteousness. It's not the result of anything God's doing in us, it's not the result of any work in us. It's His righteousness, Christ's righteousness. And it is done for Christ's sake alone. His sake alone. Not by imputing faith itself. The act of believing or any other evangelical obedience to them. In other words, again, the basis of the righteousness is not in us. It's not because God has given us faith. It's not because we have, after believing in Christ and following Him, have done something that honors the Lord. It's Christ's righteousness alone and because of his righteousness alone take a look back at our text for just a minute romans chapter 5 for if the transgression in verse 17 of the one death reigned through the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one jesus christ so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men so through one, the act of righteousness, so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Again, focusing on Christ. Notice the end of verse 19, the obedience of the one. The many were made righteous. And the one that is in view there is Christ alone. or any other evangelical obedience. Look with me to Philippians chapter 3. Verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. 
and may be found in him. And notice what he says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Not something he did or does, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 are very clear and texts that we know real well. For by grace you have been saved, right? And then he makes it explicit. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, aren't we? This is about what God is doing in us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. as their righteousness, that is, that it is not our own righteousness, but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and soul righteousness, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have, not of themselves, it is the gift of God. Go with me again to John, or let's go to John. We'll do that, and then we'll go to Romans 5. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who, again, notice the text there, believe in His name. And the emphasis on believing, not working. Now we know who those are that believe, because He explains that in the 13th verse, doesn't He? Those are those who have been born of God, or excuse me, not born of the blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. They believe because they were regenerated. They have a new nature. With the new nature came a new gift. That gift is faith. And they exercise that and believe. Romans 5, 17. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. It's God's gift by His grace to His people on the basis of Jesus. On the basis of Jesus. And they receive that by faith. R.C. Sproul says that because this righteousness is the righteousness of Christ, not of the person, and because that righteousness is added to the account of the believer, it is then a synthesis. And in a synthesis, something new is added to something old. It's described then as an alien righteousness. It's alien because it's not our righteousness that God has justified us by, but by the righteousness of another, that being Jesus Christ, right? An alien righteousness, a synthesis where something that is Christ's righteousness which is new, is added to us, to our account, credited to us, imputed to us, or charged to our account, to God's elect, and that when they believe. Paragraph number two. Faith thus receiving 
and resting on Christ and his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. We have often said and recently pointed out that faith is the instrumental means of justification since it's by faith that the sinner understands and believes in the merit of Christ alone. His merit being his work of obedience and his life lived in obedience to the Father and his death on the cross. He was obedient unto what? Philippians says to death, wasn't he? Even death on the cross. Perfect obedience, illustrative of perfect righteousness, charged to our account. Praise the Lord. Romans 3, 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Notice there, we're justified by faith apart from, without the works of the law. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. This justification, this righteousness um, comes to us through the instrumental means of faith as God credits it to our account. And he does that apart from the works of the law. Notice the document says, as it goes on, yet it is not alone in the person justified. And that almost sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? We're justified, we would say, by faith alone, but not, we would say, faith that is alone. And now we get into defining a biblical faith, don't we? What are the elements of biblical faith that we have talked about before? And uh, we have explained that biblical faith or a faith that is instrumental in justification is a faith that has content, right? It has truth. And in this case, the truth is the righteousness of Christ, isn't it? It's a faith that is assenting to that truth, acknowledging it. Uh, being aware of it and a faith that is committed to it, right? And then a faith that exhibits itself in that commitment, in its behavior, its works. Does that make sense? It's faith alone that justifies us, but that faith, although it alone justifies us, it is itself not alone. It demonstrates its reality by works. Not works that justify, but works as a result of being changed by God. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. That's where we get the phrase, faith is not alone. If it is by itself, if it has no works that accompany it, even though real faith has works that accompany it, and that those accompanying works are not what justifies, but faith that has not those works is not biblical faith. It's masquerading as faith, perhaps, but it's not biblical. And the mask that it may have on may be a mask of false doctrine. And if it says that righteousness is infused, then that's not a biblical faith. Because biblical faith is founded on God's Word. 
and God's Word doesn't teach an infused righteousness. It teaches a righteousness that's imputed or counted. It's a forensic righteousness. It's a righteousness by which God declares the person righteous. Not because of their righteousness, but because of Christ. Does that make sense? So important to us. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther, as you are aware, spoke of the fact that the Reformation and the church in the Reformation stood on that principle. And so much so, it does. Galatians, uh, or excuse me, James 2 and verse 22. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Faith was perfected. What does it mean, faith was perfected? Was faith imperfect? Was faith inadequate? And whenever Abram or Abraham started to work, then he made up the difference? That's not what is being communicated here. John. Okay, faith was completed. That's right. The, uh, the concept here is it's perfected in this overall context before us. It's demonstrated before us. It's, we see the whole scope of it. It's completed, not in the sense that it lacked anything, but we see its whole in his works. Does that make sense? Whenever Abraham was told to, to go and sacrifice his son Isaac, if he would have said, no way, would you have concluded he was a man of faith? I wouldn't. I would have concluded that's not biblical faith. It lacks works. He can't be a person who truly believes God if I can't see the evidence of that. So before me, it, he wouldn't have been justified. He wouldn't have been just. Now, God sees faith at work in the heart, doesn't he? He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That was the first account of Abraham's faith, and God saw that. You and I didn't see that until we saw the works. Verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's very simple. Whenever you're sharing with someone that will say to you, well, you believe that once you are saved, you're always saved, and you'll never lose that salvation. And we would agree that that is true. But we do not say that we can go out and do whatever we want. That's not what we're saying. We might say, in theory, a person could go out and do whatever they want, and that's not going to change their salvation if they're truly saved, theoretically. But our position would be, they're true believers. They will exemplify that by their behavior. And thus, we will see their true faith. We would say of a person who's not living that way, we can't see the evidence of faith, so we have no way to conclude they're living by faith, right? or faith is present. That's this context of James. And you can see that as you work or back up for just a moment. Notice verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? A faith without works, as we've already seen in this immediate context, is a dead faith. A dead faith doesn't save anyone, does it? That's a faith that is alone. Then he goes on and he says, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. It's not a biblical faith. It's not real faith. But someone may, may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Are you going to be able to show anyone your faith without works? 
They can't look on the heart, can they? They can't see that. The only way faith is evident to people is by that faith working. You believe that God is one, you do well, the demons also believe and shudder, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? What about Abraham, our father? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his own son, his son on the altar? And to that we answer, yes, he was justified in the eyes of people, wasn't he? Whenever you go back, Paul in Romans 4 specifically said that Abraham was justified by faith apart from works. What's he talking about there? He's talking about justified by the faith that he believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. But that faith that was instrumental in his justification before God was not a faith that was alone. That faith worked. It performed acts of obedience. And that's where James comes in. Paragraph number three. I should back up. Anyone, any comments or questions there on that second paragraph? Especially with regard to the fact that we're justify, justified by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. It's not an empty faith. Number three, Christ by his obedience and death did fully discharge the debt of all those that are justified and did by the sacrifice of himself in the blood of his cross, undergoing in their stead the penalty due unto them, make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to God's justice in their behalf. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. What was the offering he gave? Referring to Christ. Himself, right? He died on the cross in our place. And notice this. By that offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. 1 Peter 1. Verse 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Isaiah 53. Back into the Old Testament. This we could really actually read this entire chapter of Isaiah 53. They reference Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. And you'll see why specifically they reference this text. But he was pierced through for what? Our transgression. Our transgressions, excuse me. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was in our stead, in our place. He satisfied God's justice on our behalf. Yet, 
as the document goes on to say, inasmuch as he was given by the Father for them, and his obedience and satisfaction accepted in their stead, and both freely, not for anything in them, their justification is only of free grace. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? You know, that's a very powerful verse. We are recipients of all of the things of God that He has for us in Christ. He's not holding anything back. Sometimes we might feel that way, but we're not called to live as Christians based on how we feel, are we? Or our senses. We're called to live by faith. He's not going to withhold any good thing from His people that He has for them. What? A great praise and blessing that is. Second Corinthians five twenty one. A text that we've looked at multiple times as we have moved through this document, but again, a powerful verse communicating to us the substitutionary death of Christ and the sufficiency of that. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He's done this on our behalf freely. What a praise. I'm gonna there's not a this text isn't referenced here, but I'd like to give you another reference. It's back in Romans chapter eight. And look at verse one with me. Again, dealing with the, the uh, fact that Christ, His life of righteousness has satisfied, and His death on our behalf has satisfied the law of God. Romans 8, 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known... I'll get my text, my books right here in a moment. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There... For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So how much condemnation, uh, how much of God's condemnation, His wrath, are we going to have to bear? None, right? It doesn't exist for us. He's poured it out on Christ. So how could any be left over for us? Christ obtained redemption, eternal redemption, right? And the result of that in the life of the believer is the fact that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law of the Spirit of life in, excuse me, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, that's referring to our sinfulness, God did. He has done what we could not do. We couldn't keep the law, right? It was weak in that sense through the flesh. God did it. How did He do it? He tells us, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not that He was a sinner, but that He had a human body. He was a man. And as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law, what does the, re the law require? Total righteousness. 100% perfection, right? Not 99%. You know, if it only required 99%, there'd be a problem, wouldn't there? God would have to judge the other 
And you know what having 1% of sin will do before the throne of God? It'll send you 100% into hell every single time. And so all of the people they are saying they're working for it, they've got a problem because they could always do a little better, right? Some one particular cult says that you're saved by grace after you've done all that you can do. When and where is that? Have we ever done all that we could do? We think that we have. I know that. But we can't do anything. The text says, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Romans chapter 3 and verse 26, speaking of the fact that um, that God is the one who's glorified in all of this. Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. At the end of the day, it's about God and His glory and His righteousness. That's what this document is now communicating freely. Not for anything in them. Their justification is only of free grace that both the exact justice and rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. It's about God and His glory not our own. Ephesians 1, 6, and 7. We've looked at these multiple times. I'll ask you to turn there with me. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In Him we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of His grace. You can jump down in the same text of verse 12. To the end that we were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Notice who our hope is in. In Christ, right? Not in ourselves, not in our ability, not in our works, but in Him. And that's to the praise of His glory, isn't it? Not our own. I mean, this is a theme that's repeated, as you see here now, all through the New Testament, isn't it? Verse 7 of chapter 2 says, So that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask you to turn over to a couple of more texts of Scripture here before we close this evening. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 and chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John 2.2 2, and then after 4.10 we'll close. Notice this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, And He Himself, that is Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, that is the satisfaction for our sins. And not, our, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Chapter 4, verse 10. Repeating, in essence, the same truth. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son, and notice this, to be the propitiation, that is, the satisfier, the satisfaction for our sins. This text, both of these verses, is about who Christ is. He is the propitiation. That is, He's the one who satisfies the wrath of God. He's not a potential propitiation. He's not a potential propitiation. In other words, God's wrath isn't satisfied on the basis of faith and a person believing in Christ. God's wrath is satisfied in the death 
of Christ. And biblical faith believes in Christ and in the fact that he's the Savior, he's the propitiation. He's not potentially a propitiation waiting for someone to believe. He's already satisfied the wrath of God. And so the propitiation is not contingent on the one believing in Christ. And this is also not merely a title as it speaks to that which Christ has already accomplished. It's done. He is the propitiation. Christ's propitiation, his propitiatory sacrifice is effective. He really did satisfy the wrath of God for those for whom he died. This effect will not ever be overruled or it will never be thwarted. It cannot be. That is back to that golden chain of redemption there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30 that deals with the fact those that God predestined, those individuals, he, those are the ones he called, he justified, he's going to glorify them. They are sewn up together by God's grace in Jesus Christ. And that propitiation extends to both Jews and Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Gentiles. And in that sense, it's for the whole world. Not every individual, but for every elect individual. That is from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. Any comments or questions before we close this evening? Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, for a new life, for faith to believe in him. Thank you that on the basis of Christ's righteousness, and through faith in him, your people are justified by you. Declared righteous, not because of who we are, but because of him. In Jesus' name, amen.